All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to kind of get this thing going here, but it's good to see uh, a nice turnout, people interested in what's going on in the city. We've been going through a planning process and talking to everybody about what's going on, what should we do, trying to get as much input as we possibly can uh, from businesses and residents and people that actually live here and go through here, use our streets, use our bike paths, use absolutely everything that uh, uh, they possibly can, we hope. But the question is, what should it be and what should it look like moving forward? And I think you're going to get a great presentation right here tonight. Uh, uh, we've got some real great consultants. Sam Schwartz is here. Um, he's going to uh, go through it with his team. And uh, we're going to ask you uh, a lot of questions about a lot of situations, a lot of scenarios. We want your honest input. Uh, we want to know kind of who you think you are, and that's represented by some of the stuff in the back. You know, are you really aggressive uh, out there? Are you kind of confident? And, uh, but are you, uh-oh, I'm, I'm a little leery of what's going on. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. I think it'll be a fun night, and let's get uh, moving with it. Again, thank you, everybody, for participating, not only in this, but through our whole planning process, because uh, this is never-ending. We want to always continue to try to do what we can to make Des Moines a better place to live, a better place to uh, move around in, uh, a better place to raise a family, and maybe even uh, have work and, and do your business. So I'll turn it over. Jennifer, are you going to jump up? All right. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Jennifer McCoy. I am the city traffic engineer. I'm just going to say a few short words to kick tonight off. Um, some of you may have participated in the planned DSM process that we had underway the past um, 12 to 18 months ago. And so this new project, our transportation master plan, is not something entirely new. It's basically taking that transportation vision that came out of Plan DSM and just uh, going further with it. So uh, that's why we've kind of coined it Move DSM, just to further just kind of marry those two together, that this isn't starting from scratch. This is really taking what we've done with the work the city's done and really just building upon it in the transportation area. Um, I know that uh, our consultant team's going to touch a little bit on some of the goals and the vision that came out of Plan DSM, but it really was about a multimodal fo focus and equitable access to transportation across the city. So that's really what we're looking to to um, accomplish as we move uh, forward with this vision for this plan. So you'll see a lot of those elements here tonight. It's really looking about just be on the vehicle. Let's let's look what's what's happening beyond the vehicle. Are more things that we can do. So, uh, Sam Schwartz Consulting is our consultant that the city has selected for this presentation, or for this uh, presentation, and also for this project. Uh, Stacy Meekins is the project manager, and then Sam Schwartz is actually the founder of the company, and he's here this evening to just kind of set the stage for us as far as why is this important? Why is looking at all modes and looking at things beyond the vehicle important as we look to our future in the city of Des Moines. So I'm just going to say a few words about Sam and I'll invite him up to, to talk with you guys as well and then Stacy will kind of wrap things up with how the rest of the evening is going to go with the open house um, format after kind of a short presentation. So Sam Schwartz is president and CEO of Sam Schwartz Consulting. It's a firm that specializes in transportation planning and engineering. He also writes columns on traffic for the New York Daily News and the New York Downtown Express. He was New York City uh, Traffic Commissioner and was the Chief Engineer of the New York City Department of Transportation. He started his transportation career in the late 1960s as a cabbie in New York and joined the Traffic Department as a junior engineer in 1971. He has been an adjunct professor at Cooper Union, Long Island University, and Brooklyn College. He's a prolific writer, and his most recent book, Street Smart, The Rise of City and Fall of Cars, received critical acclaim. His next book, due out next year in 2018, is Driverless Cars, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Sam specializes in creative problem solving and is an expert at getting people out of their cars and into other forms of transportation. But he's also very proficient at moving people who remain in their cars and uh, more swiftly and safely. Um, he always strives to get win-win-win situations where traffic moves better, pedestrians are safer, and the community gains more sidewalk and green space. 
Uh, before I invite Sam up, there's one last thing I did want to mention. Um, Connect Downtown, which is the downtown transportation plan. We're talking about the citywide transportation master plan. If you can think of the downtown kind of being a piece out of that. Um, that is also a planning effort that is going to have another series of public meetings on Thursday. If you're really interested in what the vision for downtown is specifically, that's happening separate outside of this plan. And that there are two meetings on Thursday, both at the historical building in the East Village, noon to 1.30, and then also 6 to 7.30. So I did want to put a plug in for those. And with that, I will invite Sam up. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for that, that introduction. And uh, thank you, Mayor County. I, I'm very, very uh, optimistic about uh, Des Moines, especially meeting a number of your elected officials and a number of the people that are in your public works departments. Uh, there's an extraordinary opportunity here, and it is an extraordinary place. And I've been getting to know it a little bit in the past couple of days and walking it, and, and I realize my shoes are now covered with dust having walked through <laughs> about five miles of streets today uh, through the area. Uh, but you are a lot different than a lot of other cities. A lot of younger people, a lot of uh, well-educated people are, are moving into your downtowns, but also citywide. Uh, you drive less than the average Iowan, and you drive less than the average American dramatically. You drive about 6,700 miles versus 10,700 miles versus the average person in the state, and over 10,000 for the average American. So there's something very unusual going on. Your commute time is one of the lowest uh, in the country. And so there's something right, there's a lot of things right about Des Moines, and there are uh, some real opportunities ahead. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about what Jennifer talked about, win, 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 that it's not pedestrians uh, versus the bike riders versus the cars, everybody could win, and that ought to be the goal going forward. So we talk about transforming transportation, building smart streets. Nick, uh, you can try, yes. And uh, a little bit of, in my history where I learned very quickly that we can get by and do really quite nicely with less capacity than we've built over the years, especially since World War II. We built so, many, so much capacity, highway capacity, in city after city, state after state, and what we've done is we've induced traffic each time we've done it. And so much, many studies have now shown that that is indeed the case, that building more means that you will, in fact, generate more traffic. And you won't necessarily generate a higher GDP. You won't necessarily generate a higher quality of life. That it really isn't, those aren't the, the factors that seem to rise with that. This is a highway when I was a junior engineer uh, I got a call one day in 1973, the highway collapsed. It's the West Side Highway on the west side of Manhattan. It fell to the ground, and my job was to handle the traffic. Well, something strange happened over time, and that's a, that a good deal of the traffic seemed to disappear, but the number of people coming into our business district, this is located on the edge of the business district, went up. Business went up. Business was thriving after what people thought would be Carmageddon, a catastrophe. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this, this has now turned into a gold coast in the New York City area, the West Side Highway, and it has all the things that you would want in a street except for transit, but there's a 16-foot physically separated bike lane. And the plan is ultimately you can do most of the 27 miles around the island of Manhattan on a protected bikeway. And over here you have 16 foot wide, incredibly well used. You then have a separate pedestrian path. You have lots of greenery. You have parks that have sprung up uh, and various uh, uh, centers have sprung up. The land use along uh, the west side was the least desirable land use in New York City. It abutted Hell's Kitchen. It was, nobody would want to live there. Now it is, uh, as I said, a gold coast. Uh, and you can see how pedestrians can eat more easily cross the street. And this is happening in a number of places. Uh, in San Francisco, similarly, the Embarcadero came down in an earthquake. And now that area of San Francisco is just doing beautifully. And San Francisco as a city is doing so well with one less highway. 
I was just in Rochester, New York, and they, they're filling in a highway, realizing they, they don't need the highway, and what an opportunity it then presents for a city. So you may be able to get by and get by really well with a little bit less in transforming uh, your streets. Uh, a few years ago, I noticed something that was very, very strange in transportation. And you heard that I've been in the transportation business for about a half century, starting as a cab driver and then as a professional engineer, uh, working as a traffic commissioner and then as a consultant and a professor of engineering. This is one of the books I wrote, came out last year, it's called Street Smart, The Rise of Cities and the Fall of Cars. And the reason I wrote it, next slide, is that something happened that no one seemed to notice, and something happened that had never happened before, and it was a total surprise and it was a mystery to most people. And it was nothing short of a revolution in cities and in transportation. This slide to the left shows you vehicle miles traveled. That's how much driving we do in the United States. And from 1900, you could see the advent of the car uh, the green line starts going up and up and up. We have World War II. It goes down a little bit slower during the uh, Great Depression. Then continues, shoots straight up post-World War II, unabated, a little bit of a fuel crisis in the 1970s. And then sometime around 2000 or so, 2002, 2003, different places in the United States, but every place in the United States started to see a change. People were predicting vehicle miles traveled would just soar, driving would soar. But what happened over the next 10 years is that driving actually started to go down. It was unprecedented. It was unpredicted. There was no transportation professional that could say, I take the credit for it, or that I predicted it. Everybody was predicting the opposite, kind of like the stock market predicting it's going to hit 30,000 or something like that. Nobody was thinking that driving would go down. And so I began doing research for the book on why this occurred and found that while driving went down among a number of different groups, it wasn't the economy. This preceded the Great Recession. It started around 2003, 2004. Some places it was 2006, 2007. It accelerated through the recession and then every single recession, immediately after that recession was over, vehicle miles traveled, driving went up. Not this time. It continued going down for another four years after the recession was declared over. So what was going on? Turns out when you look at, at, the, different, at the population, you found one group that was driving less. And it's not one or two percent less. Millennials were driving 20 to 25% fewer miles. They were the revolution. They were making it happen without all the planners working so hard to try to get people out of cars into public transportation, into walking, into biking. A generation did it. And still some of the reasons are unclear, but a number of things that I cite in the book is that in 19, 1960s, and 1970s and 80s and 90s, people came of age, they couldn't wait to get their driver's license, and they viewed a car as a symbol of freedom. Well, the new generation, the millennial generations, now view this as freedom. This is a mobility portfolio. This will call an Uber right over here in five minutes if I need it. It will call it, and I've used it in Europe. It will tell me when the next train is arriving, when the next bus is arriving. It'll tell me the best route, the fastest route. It'll tell me where the bike share is. It'll tell me where the next bike share station is. It is a full mobility portfolio. And that's only one of the reasons. Another reason, by the way, is something that government did that, again, people didn't seem to notice. And government did it on a state level and did it in 50 states and passed something called graduated driver's licenses. And it made it a little harder for 16-year-olds to get a license and drive with other 16-year-olds in the car. And it was because state after state was fed up with 
hearing the terrible stories of teenagers getting killed in traffic crashes. Our brains aren't fully developed at 16 years old, and we make really, really bad decisions, and too many children were dying in car crashes. So state after state passed these rules, making it a little difficult for 16-year-olds to drive with other 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, and, and there were still some impediments to getting a driver's license, and then a whole generation went off to college, and many of them did not have driver's licenses. And suddenly they realized that they could live a life and get around without a driver's license. Now, it's not the majority. When I say a 20 to 25% shift, the millennials have gone from 90, 95% driving to about 70% driving. Because whenever I speak, somebody says, well, I've got three kids and they all drive and they drive everywhere. It's still the majority are driving, but a 20 to 25% shift is dramatic. And it means less burden, less infrastructure, less energy consumed, less pollution, smaller carbon footprint. There are so many benefits, a healthier society. So cities that are recognizing that, taking advantage of it, are the cities that are, are the winners and going to be the winners going forward. And for many years, my firm was a firm that big cities would call in. Well, right now, city after city, mid-sized cities, we're working in, in Fargo, North Dakota, in Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids Michigan, Boise, Idaho, and, and uh, here we are in Des Moines, Iowa. We're working in so many different places uh, because people recognize that if you change, your streets say something about you, and if you change some of the travel behaviors, you attract a very mobile class, a very energetic class. Your, your GDP goes up and all sorts of opportunities occur. Uh, Iowa VMT, if you take a look, it also followed a pattern of going down for a number of years. We've seen an increase the last couple of years. Next slide. And I talked about more traffic and answering that with more road building and that not being the answer because what happens with the, the additional road building is we induce more traffic. So Einstein said um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And we did this for 70 years in this country, and now finally a number of people are getting the idea that that is not the solution. Next. And we talked about reshaping the market. It's not just the millennials. It's a lot of the baby boomers, the seniors like myself, that are finding it's a little more difficult to drive at night. I have to wear an extra set of glasses on top of contact lenses to drive at night. It's tougher for us as we get older to get around. So walking environments are very good for all classes of people, for all people on that. And it's not just the millennials. The, the industry is now recognizing that there has been such a shift that Ford Motor Company, which is a client, and I'm meeting with the CEO of Ford tomorrow, Ford Motor Company is now changing its whole uh, ethos going from a car company to a mobility company. And we're helping them think about that. And they're launching products such as Microtransit, which is Chariot, which is a bus service on demand, which is a smaller bus. So our concept right now, especially in mid-sized cities, is that of lumbering buses that uh, move with 40, 40 feet long, 40 to 50 passenger capacity, and you see three people per bus, and it's very expensive, and, it's, it's, uh, and as a result, there's little investment in transit, and when you provide poor transit, when you don't, don't invest enough, it will be poor transit, and when it becomes poor transit, sadly, it becomes the transit of the poor, and we're leaving out a whole group of people when we do that. Microtransit has an opportunity to be on demand, to know that there are a group of people here tonight, let's say it's 10 years from now, you don't need a car anymore because chariot might pick you up or some other form of transit may pick you up. And it's far more efficient than Uber or even Uber Pool or something like that. Ford is getting into bike and bike share and looking at new products. And so this is happening around the world and I'm very glad to see uh, here we're, we're taking a look at that. Uh, the other thing is accessibility uh, versus mobility. Uh, we, for many years, we thought mobility 
was the answer, that we wanted to go faster and, fur and further. And so we kept designing these highways to go faster, these cars to go faster, when we didn't realize what it was really about is accessibility. So here we're building uh, mixed-use development. This is on Court at 4th, where people can go downstairs, buy a quart of milk or whatever they need to buy. That's accessibility. Not getting in your car, moving at 50 miles an hour, traveling 10 miles, and using up a quart of gas to get a quart of milk. That is not accessibility. That might be mobility. So there's a big difference between that. Next. And tackling the public safety epidemic, uh, the slower, this is very obvious, but the slower you travel, should there be a crash, the likelihood of survival is so much higher. And sadly, in the United States, we've seen a huge surge in pedestrian and bicycle fatalities. And next slide, please. And this is launched in city after city, a program called Vision Zero. This is Vision Zero Alexandria, Virginia, Seattle, a number of other places, Chicago, Washington, D.C., because every, every death is a tragedy. And we no longer use the word accident. We call it crash, because in many cases, there is a cause. It's not just an act of, of God that happens that we have a car crash. There are reasons for car crashes. And if you look at some of the reasons uh, for car crashes, it has to do with street design. It has to do with mixing pedestrians, bike riders, cars in the wrong way. And design can help a great deal. Next. And there's another uh, crisis, and that is inactivity. We've become far less active than we were when we had to walk to school, walk to the store, uh, you know, walk to your job, or take transit, or use your body in some way as opposed to park right outside and use your car to travel three blocks to go to the next destination. That is taking a toll on us, and it's taking a toll on us not just nationally, it's taking a toll on us internationally. In the past year, inactivity deaths have, for the first time, exceeded death by smoking. So it's extraordinary what is happening. It's happening worldwide, very much in the United States, inactivity deaths, and far more inactivity deaths than we have motor crash deaths, which are at all-time all high levels for, for this century of over 40,000 uh, deaths on that. Next. And Des Moines, looks like Des Moines could uh, become more active on the uh, scale of Obesity, percent obese, you're closer to the higher obesity levels than the lower ones. This is an opportunity for a city to decide that you want to walk and bike more, that you want to do active transportation, take public transportation, whatever it is. All those things add up to calories burned. They add up to uh, healthier hearts lower incidence of diabetes, stroke, and other, other forms. And there has been a number of studies that have shown lifespan increases the more that you walk and the less you spend your time in your car. Next. And how do we realize the full potential of streets? Well, what we've done as traffic engineers, and I'm a traffic engineer, is we decided that nobody should have to wait. That was our goal. Level of service A, we called it. Anybody in the traffic engineering profession would, would have heard that term, and many in communities have heard the term. But it's akin to saying that at Walmart or any store, we're never going to have a line. You'll never have to wait. We'll provide enough registers so on Christmas Eve, everybody goes through with their own private register, and you never have to wait. That's what we've done with roads. So we built way too many roads. So we build roads with lots of capacity, and we don't need that capacity, so it is an opportunity now for a city to rethink itself, to rethink its streets. And this is in Boise, Idaho, where we brought in streets that look very similar to the streets we hear in, in Des Moines. And you can see that this is a street that has, encourages high speed, meaning that if there is a crash with a pedestrian or a bike, a bike rider, the likelihood of survival is, is quite low. And we could transform this 
so that we have bikes that are physically separated. We have clear pedestrian markings. Uh, we have areas to shorten crossing distances, narrower lanes, a protected bike lane on the other side of the street. This is a street that is safer and healthier and does generate more activity. Next. Uh, this is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, more in a downtown area, and how we could transform this desolate street to becoming a lively street, an exciting street, with a protected, with in this case, it's an on-street bike lane, but we take the next step in Grand Rapids and put the bike lane and physically separate the bike lane entirely. And streets come alive, and people turn out and, and move to those streets and they like those streets, and they like that kind of activity. It's been shown time and time again, whereas if we went back 50 or 60 years, we were moving away from our center cities, saying that's not where the activity is. It is in the center cities now. And guiding transportation innovation, uh, don't believe autonomous vehicles will be salvation. They, we have to be wary. They are coming. There's no stopping them. And uh, you heard that the title of my book will be Driverless Cars, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And so I hope Des Moines embarks on a good approach to autonomous vehicles. There are some very bad approaches that will lead towards greater inactivity. If you want to carry it to, the, to, the, to infinity, you just watch the film WALL-E. Everybody is sitting in their autonomous vehicle and their legs no longer work. I know that's extreme, but it's happening in a lot of places where people can no longer walk because they've spent their lives behind the wheel of a car on it. And this is a picture that I used uh, before I came to Des Moines. I've been using this a lot, and it's, uh, it was taken right here. And I'm sure everybody here knows the street. Uh, and yesterday at a presentation, this picture was taken by Tobin Bennett. A few people in the audience said, oh, that's me. That's me in the picture over there. So I don't know if anybody here is in in that picture or knows Tobin Bennett. But it's, it tells the story. Whether you have autonomous cars, if they are going to be the cars that we know that today, where it's a single occupant dominates most of the cars, then you're going to have no difference in traffic congestion. It occupies the same amount of space. If you invest more in automated transit, microtransit, those types of things, you will see lots of opportunities in your cities. Next. And funding it, uh, states and cities have now come to the conclusion, it's no surprise, I'm sure to anybody here, that the feds aren't coming to the rescue. And so funding plans need to be developed to help you advance forward. I don't have the answers for you, and I know it is complicated because for any kind of tax increase, you have to, sales tax increase, you have to get the surrounding communities. But there are other innovative ways of funding that you might take a look at. You see, many cities now are trying to solve the problems on their own by uh, developing their own transportation funding programs. Next. And this, this is my concluding slide, comes from Back to the Future. Your future is whatever you make it, and that's what you hear today about. You hear about the future. You hear about the future of Des Moines and the opportunities. So make it a good future. But learn from history. Don't learn from Einstein. Don't repeat the same mistakes. Be wary. Don't be so trustful of all the hype you're going to hear about autonomous vehicles. And plan well for the future. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Stacy Meekins. Thank you. So what we really noticed when we first started this and reading Plan DSM to get acquainted with the city and the city's goals is that these are all really about becoming more multimodal and becoming more equitable in, in transportation. And as Sam mentioned, we really see a lot of opportunity here. And thankfully, you guys don't have to tear down a highway to make a drastic change. Um, but we do see a lot of opportunity on a lot of the streets that are maybe four lanes now that maybe they don't need to be. And that's the kind of thing that we're going to be looking into. Where could we shift um, the transportation infrastructure, the resources that are there, to make the system more equitable? 
So our schedule in a nutshell is we, we kicked this off in January. Um, we're here tonight for our first round of public events. We had one last night and this, this open house tonight. Uh, we're going to continue doing some public outreach through the summer. So we're going to do a couple pop-up events in neighborhoods throughout Des Moines. So look for that. We have your email addresses now um, from the sign-in sheet and we'll keep you updated on activities as they, as they come about. So what we've been doing this spring is just a lot of data collection and looking into what is the transportation system like now, um, talking to stakeholders, talking to the staff, and again here talking to you tonight. And then in the, through the summer and the fall, we're going to start looking at what does the future, what should the future look like? And we're taking cues from um, the input we get tonight and through the summer. And again, coming back to work with the steering committee in September, October, and work with the regional planning organization to project what does the future look like in Des Moines. And we're not going to assume that we are all knowing and know that the future is one thing and, and we know what it is. So what we're going to do is look at a, a number of different scenarios and see how that plays out for different modes of transportation and what that could mean for the streets in Des Moines. Um, so one concept that I wanted to introduce you to tonight is the idea of a street typology. And what that is, is a way of classifying streets that is a little bit more descriptive than what we've done in the past. So again, taking learning from history and maybe doing things a little bit differently, we're going to start by classifying streets based on what kind of context they're in. Uh, is it downtown? Is it out in a neighborhood? What's the character of the street, or what should it be, I should say? What are the multimodal needs on that street? So not just how many cars do we need to move, but who else needs to be using the street in order to have access across the whole city. Um, so down the, the right side are just some examples from other cities, and this, these aren't all taken from one place, so they don't necessarily all go together, but just some classifications that other cities have used. There could be a downtown commercial street versus a neighborhood commercial street, or a downtown <coughs> throughway versus a neighborhood connector or a residential connector is another way of classifying it. Um, industrial streets. Not always the most fun type of street to talk about and, and brainstorm, but they're still necessary. We still need to get trucks through our city, so we need places for them to go. Um, there could be a shared street or a boulevard like Polk or Kingman uh, or a park street, either along the edge of a park or going through a park or an alley is another type of special kind of typology. So as I said, we're here tonight to start hearing from you. Um, we have a number of activities here tonight for you. We have three stations. On my left, your right, is what we're calling the Streets of Des Moines. And what we want to hear from you at, at this station is what is it about some of the streets in Des Moines that you like or maybe even don't like? And how are you using these streets now? And, and what are you using them for? So we have a comment card that kind of leads you through giving us that information in a Mad Libs kind of format. So we're letting you be a kid again for an hour or so. Um, and then on my right, your left, we have a number of different pictures from other cities, streets that we've found elsewhere, and pulled out different street elements so these might be things that you haven't seen in Des Moines. Some of them you will have seen in Des Moines, but some might be new. And we want to hear from you, what do you like the best? So we're going to give you five stickers and ask you to vote for the elements that you like the best. Um, and then these are categorized by different types of street. Um, so there's a category for residential streets, major thoroughfares, and neighborhood commercial streets. And then in the back, um, we have a, an activity particular to biking, and so we want to know what kind of biker do you see yourself, and then ranking streets um, based on whether or not, not ranking them, but telling us whether or not you're comfortable biking on those streets. 
So we are also, we have a, a website that's active and we encourage you to go to www.movedsm.org and tell your friends about it, tell your aunts and uncles about it. Please just keep driving people to our website. Um, we are going to have additional interactive activities on the website in a rotating basis. So similar, they'll be kind of similar to what you see tonight to start um, in a more f online friendly format, of course. And then probably every six weeks or eight weeks, we're going to update that with a new activity. And if you're on our email list, you'll get an email to let you know when there's a new activity for you to go to the website and, um, and give us your input. So that's all. With that, um, you know, we're, we're here to roam the room and answer any questions that you might have and just encourage you to go visit the boards and give us your feedback. Thanks.